Thanks, Jeremy. I'm really, really pleased to, to have seen you uh, and a great event, obviously, uh, really perfectly organized. So um, I'm here to uh, talk about several topics. And, and the first thing uh, I'm going to introduce is a, a debate, which uh, political debate, TV political debate, which is gaining uh, global attention. Um, a generation of, of you who watch TV and use TV as a source of information uh, probably watch at least two to three uh, political debates a week. But many of you are also tired of, uh, of uh, debates where there is constantly yes and no, uh, pros and cons, so uh, like a battlefield in, in which someone has to, to win uh, the battle. So the debate we are going to talk now about about uh, with my uh, great guest uh, and my colleague from Norwegian uh, Broadcast Corporation, Public TV, is a producer, Gro en uh, Engen. Gro, welcome to uh, this uh, event. Um, just a couple words of, uh, about Gro. Uh, Gro has been a journalist for more than 20 years. She was host of one of Norway's biggest news and debate programs uh, at uh, Norwegian Public TV. TV called Uke Slut, uh, which means end of the week. She also produced investigative radio documentaries. And this is a very interesting topic she, she covered when she was working on, on radio, female violence against men. Um, right now, uh, she is in charge of uh, the program uh, I'd really like you to know more about. It's called uh, ANI, which means Do You Agree? And it's a very interesting format, as I said, uh, gaining attention uh, across the globe. So, uh, Gro, I'd like you to tell us a bit more about the program. But before you start, I just want to invite our audience to uh, start thinking what you want Gro and me to answer, what kind of debate you want us to, to, to have with you. So your floor will be somewhere towards the end of this debate, but we really, really want you to tell us what you think about Gro's program and whether something she's doing in Norway can be useful um, in your country. Gro, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Melissa. Well, uh, agree, as we call it in English, uh, or do you agree? It's it's all started out with uh, two colleagues of mine that were the host and the editor of Norway's biggest debate show on television. Yeah, yeah. They were doing that for about 10 years or so, and they thought that the uh, debate didn't really change that much, and there wasn't that really something important happening other than that than that the politicians were coming to the studio and saying what they had prepared and rehearsed before they came, not listening very much to the host asking questions and not listening very much to each other debating. So what they found out was that when the cameras were turned off and the lights were turned off and they went into the green room or backstage, the conversation got much more interesting and they were discussing and listening and curious about each other and asking each other questions. So they thought that so very much that that was the kind of debate that they wanted to make. And I'm going to show you some of our pictures of our program and share that with you. Can you see this now? Yes, we can. Great. Because they, that, that was, like I said, the, the birth of Einig, it started out there. And, and, uh, and agreed, uh, we, had, we had one season, five episodes, and it also, and, and it ended up being more like a discussion without accusation and suspicion, really. And here you see the studio, and we have four participants here. And the thing is, why do we need a program like Agree in Norway and the rest of the world? Well, what we found out is that people are tired of the typical politician talk. And it's not just using a difficult language, it's also all the pre-rehearsed sentences that you hear if you tur turn on the radio and later on you hear the same person speaking on the in the television and it's like he says exactly the same thing with the exact same words in the same way. But, and also we want to have our own opinion, but we also need some help to find it. And I think hope is very important. Uh, because we tend to have the classical debate, which are very much more like 
a war where someone is going to win the war, but that's not really what it's like in the real world because it's not that polarized. There is something happening in the middle and that's what we're trying to find out and help the participants also to find. And we do have some dogma, some practical things for the pro program. We have two to four participants and it's always at least two politicians. Uh, we chose controversial topics. These two you see on the picture now, they're discussing finance. We chose gender equality. We had um, immigration, abortion, and of course, climate change. A statement starts each discussion. Uh, for instance, they are now discussing in this picture, Norway needs a lot of rich people. Uh, and those who agree to the sentence or the statement that comes up on the wall, which we have decided in beforehand, they start to raise their hand and then explain why, and then the discussion starts. We don't have a show host, but we do interrupt if we need it. We did try with a show host, but what happened is that you tend to fall into the old pitfall when they tend, uh, the participants are relating and always turning to the show host for sort of a confirmation. Uh, low key studio, what you see here is the garage in Anarchy actually, that saved us also a lot of money. We got a lot of attention after that, which made us really happy. Um, the, BBC, the BBC interviews us, interviewed us several times, like you, see, like you can see the Times made a story, Reuters, and it also went around the world. We also got a lot of nice attention from the big Norwegian media. But what we were aiming for were the young people um, who left the debate, uh, who find finds information and news elsewhere. So we had around 1.4 million viewers, I think, all together, but most of them were on the linear uh, streaming. On demand, where you find the younger, view, younger viewers, we had around 150,000 viewers. But what is a very positive thing in the end anyway, is that the young viewers, they were very young, they were 40% were around under 29, I think. So um, that's a little bit about how it all started and what's it. About. And um, I don't know about you, maybe to say something about the people you're going to uh, see right now. Gro, uh, I can't hear you quite well right now. I hope our audience can hear you. Uh, but what I would like, I even cannot see. Okay, I can see you now. But uh, what I would like before we see a little clip from one of your debates, um, uh, I'd like you to introduce uh, the, the, the topic of that particular program we are going to see. And before you uh, tell us that, if you can just tell us, how do you choose the members of the public who come to the studio? So two politicians and two members of the public. Who are these people? How do you choose them? Because this is a fantastic way for the members of the public to have a say in public media outlet. But how do you choose them? It seems that we cannot hear grow. Um, if Jeremy, if you are there, uh, or uh, Lukas, maybe you can help me make sure that we can at least watch the program. The program uh, Gro wanted all of us to see is where poor people in the studio are debating uh, the issue of immigration in Norway. And this is an issue um, with, which is quite debatable and debating in many uh, countries, not only in Europe, uh, that the four people in the studio, two politicians and, and, and two young, young people uh, coming fr from Muslim background. So Gro, did I introduce well your program or you want to add something before we see the, the clip? 
Uh, can you unmute yourself, please, girl? Sorry. I had very difficulty hearing what you said, but it was probably perfect. So just roll the video, that's fine. Thank you. Shall we see the video, please? Många invandrare vill inte bli integrerat, är ni? Varför är du enig? Eh, ordet många är jag inte nödvändigtvis enig i. Men jag upplever att eh, någon invandrare tar två steg tillbaka i möte med den norska kulturen och överlåter integrering till oss. Jag tänker att ja, kanske enkelt det inte vill bli integrerat. Men för exempel om du har social kontroll då, att kanske föräldrarna inte önskar att du ska delta så mycket som du själv önskar. Och då tänker jag, då är det inte barna eller de som är små som inte vill bli integrerat, men det är liksom den sociala kontrollen som håller det nere. Jag tänker att alla folk, alla människor, uansett var du bor och vad bakgrunden din är, så har du lust till att komma dig igenom livet. Altså, folk förstår att man må integrera sig för att för få till det da. Men att man inte helt vet hur man ska göra det. Integrering för mig är en tvåvägsprocess. Du måste ju önska integrera dig så måste du få hjälp med att integrera dig. Men men hur hur vill du då då ett konkret exempel. Mm. När en mor inte vill att dottern ska vara med på lärskola. Mm. På i barnskolan och finna allslags begrundelse för det men det är uppenbart att hur syns det är för skummelt. Mm. Och ser antagligen på lärskulle som en slags tinder eller ja. uh, som uh, med snackt om här ute. Så att alltså då blir det en uh, det är ett problem. Det är ett problem. Då, då, då ta då, att då kan en ta som en motvilje mot att bli integrerad. Ja. Och och samtidigt så egentligen får heller inte gå på fotbollsträning i alla fall så är det inte på fotbollsträning mm. till trots för att det blir väldigt inviterat mm. det blir reducerat eller gratis eh, eh, träningsavgift så att man bara måste betala medlemsavgiften så på 150 kr och sånt då är det viljan stor till integrering alltså och hade jag rest ett annat land en väldigt främmande kultur så hade ett haft ett fokus få ungarna mina med på tänk för de får det att få vänner i den här kulturen mm. för att lära språket det var mitt fokus. Men, men jag tänker det är lite annorlunda när man kommer från en väldigt öppen kultur till en lite sträng kultur och kommer från en sträng kultur till en öppen kultur för då blir man väldigt rädd för barna sina. Ja. Jag fick ju för exempel inte lov att dra på lärskola eller spela fotboll. Jag spelade fotboll i skolan och jag drog på lärskola för det är en tvång för min. Men han visste ju egentligen inte vad lärskola var men att det var Tinder. Ja. Men idag är det han som tvingar systrarna mina på lärskola på övernattningar, även om det inte är obligatoriskt att dra på de övernattningarna, de kan välja. Ja. Men när vi har frågat farn min om varför ville du inte sända mig så säger han väldigt mycket jag var rädd då. Jag har jag har ju aldrig varit bort i detta här för. Och den enda grund att han törr idag är för det jag tog den kampen. Och där så trist att se si att den integreringsansvaret ligger också lite på barna och det, det skall det egentligen inte. Men på mig gjorde ju det. Altså, det var mitt ansvar att integrera farn min. Jag skyller fortsatt på farn min sida. Det var ditt arbete. Det är din jobb. Jag skulle ja. bara vara ett barn. Men det har varit mitt arbete sedan jag var liten att integrera farn min. Ja. Vad tänker du inte var grund till att du pusha på din far för att gå på lärskola. Alltså vad tror du det grunden var? Väldigt många jenter i mitt miljö fick ju inte lov att dra. Men för de man inte fick lov så ville jag ju dra. Och för de hade en lärare som inte var likgiltig och sa, vet du vad? Ringte farmen min och sa, nej men jag skönjer att din datter ska exkluderas. När den enda klassen som inte ska vara med, hon ska faktiskt vara med så enkelt är det. Och då måste farmen min ta henne lite på det. Jag husker fortsatt den där känslan av att är du rasist eller? Och så någon år tillbaka, alltså någon år senare så säger jag till barnen min, pappa hon var aldrig rasist, hon var klikelig. Problemet här är att föräldrarna inte förstår vad lärskola handlar om. Och är lite rädd för barnen sina. Är rädd för barnen sina, ikring, ja. så man tror att man gör något bra, men så gör man egentligen något dåligt istället. Jag har erfaring, personlig erfaring med att det blir ett stort försök på att förklara vad lärskola är för föräldrar. Och likväl när dagen upprinner så är det den eleven på skolan och går där med glippa lärskolan. Så en pröva verkligen det då jag tänker att 
då tvivlar jag starkt på att de föräldrarna där önskar inte det där, de önskar heller skärma barnet från då skumla i Norge som vi mm. inte har varit länge nog att känna att kanske inte är så skummel som din far brukte tid på att förstå så han. Wow. It is fascinating for me as a former TV presenter and, and reporter to watch for four minutes a political debate where no one raises voice, no one's angry, no one's in trying to interrupt each other. Is that the concept, the basic concept you've been persuading through this show? I, I think that concludes it up, sums it up very well, actually. Um, it's not we we wanted to be like we spoke the other day and i explained to you we wanted to look more like a dinner party you sit down at a table with a lot of people you like but you disagree with and it's not that you come there and you're up to attack them you're more curious and you want to hear their opinion and why they ended up there completely different direction than yourself and also you get the ability to be listened to which is a very nice effect and without interruption and i don't think people are i think people are really tired of uh, of not having the ability to to listen and really listen to what the other person is saying and and also to really be able to answer the questions that that are asked and not just what you decided to say before you even entered well, I did ask you a question, but since you, you might have not heard it, so how do you choose the members of the public uh, as your guests? Okay, two politicians, I assume, uh, a journalist contact list is full of politicians names, but how do you choose these ordinary people? Oh, that's a very good question, because I think that's what we probably spent the most time on. Uh, first, we chose uh, the politicians and the people that we were engaged in the theme because we thought they were able to do this, to speak in this way, and that they also wanted to, and that they also saw that the, that it was a good way of doing it. Uh, so that was sort of the first reason why we chose them. And, and after that, we spent a lot of time, and more and more actually, during uh, after we record the episodes, we spent a lot of time just sort of comforting them, not researching the theme and the subject they were speaking about, but comforting them on that this is a good way of speaking, being natural, being listening, being curious, asking questions, and being listened to. And it's not that they, we think that they are going to enter the studio and agree, that's not a point. The point is that they are able to listen and to say their opinion, and maybe they also find some good arguments on the other side and can acknowledge that. But does it mean that you have a circle of people uh, who you just invite to your studio or uh, they apply themselves interested uh, in being part of the debate? You know, how do you choose them? Those are, cho those are chosen totally freely. Uh, and we only made, like I said, one season with five episodes, but we did chose them quite carefully. We didn't have sort of the prime minister. We, we chose people that were in the ministry, we did, but we also chose more low-key politicians to sort of try the concept out. But what we, so there were no sort of agreement in beforehand. And there were also someone who said no, but most of the ones we asked really wanted to join uh, the program. Well, I assume because in Media Diversity Institute, which I run in London, we constantly push uh, our colleagues who, who are journalists still uh, to broaden the list of uh, people, members of the public, uh, when they invite them, interview them. So it seems that you are going that way. Why have you produced only five shows? Uh, you haven't stopped for good. What's going on? Well, uh, I really, I wish I could answer that. But the thing is, uh, we were a bit stopped of also because of the Corona virus. But we don't, we hope we are going to do this further along. Our uh, bosses say they are very interested and it's a money thing and it's several things. But we hope and we still think that we will be able to continue producing a great 
Well, there is a question from the audience from uh, Thomas uh, uh, Bertheim. Uh, and the question goes, don't you sometimes have guests who try to discuss in an aggressive way? And how do you stop them? Oh, good question. Um, well, we haven't had any uh, guests that has been in that way. And probably that it's because we have, we have trained and pitched and spent a lot of time in beforehand telling them that that is not the concept. And if you do that, we will just edit it out. It's not interesting. And so we ha sort of have an agreement before they come that this is the way this debate is going to happen. But uh, it is also, like I said, edited. So we can sort of chain or take that, record that out in some way if it would happen. Well, uh, there are questions coming already for you, Rob, but um, you mentioned all, uh, already that people, once the, the, the shooting is done, that they are more relaxed than sitting in the studio. And I'm sure it's, it's more the case of people who don't come to studio uh, very often. You do have some footage showing actually what it's like once the, the filming is over. It would be great maybe to see that video. Yes, it would be great. It's uh, just 50 seconds telling how they, the experience was. Let's see it. Det er kult at man kan lytte til hverandre uten å liksom måtte argumentere imot, men forstå. Det, vi gjør ikke det så ofte i Norge. Vi bare vil gå og attacke, men her sitter vi og prøver å forstå hverandre. Veldig lite polarisering, og det tror jeg er konstruktivt. Jeg tror håp er så viktig å ikke miste. Faktisk så viktig. Mm. Og jeg er veldig stolt over uh, debatten. Da. Jeg synes det var skikkelig hyggelig å sitte her i dag og kunne liksom, diskutere på en ordentlig måte. Og ikke liksom, skulle prøve å overbevise ti stykker hjemme i stua som ikke er her. Liksom. <laughs> Så jeg, jeg har lyst til å ha mer av det her, tror jeg. Ja. Ja. <laughs> well, they're smiling much more than, than during the show, obviously. Um, more questions for you, um, uh, Gro, and I hope you don't mind it. We are in, we have included the audience already. That's fine. The question from, from uh, Vladimir Vorobiev, Vorobiev, sorry, Vladimir. How do you make people obey the dogmas? What happens if a guest breaks them, starts to offend the opponents, for example? Well, that is pretty much what I said uh, said uh, uh, before the video that I would be a bit surprised if that happened because we spent so much time researching that in beforehand. But if it happened, we I don't know, we would just say this is not what we agreed on. If you want that kind of fight, I think you've came come to the wrong place, really. So I would be a bit surprised. We, we would have done a pretty bad job in our research research. Uh, the work but, but of course that can happen yes but is it a, a that's not a live that's recorded show yeah yes so you have means to take out what you that's not, right. what doesn't fit into your concept is that the you know what you can do too so what is what is the next step what's your plan are you going to sell the show idea to bbc to well, South we China had, Post, we 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 had some uh, some people from from Britain actually when we when we were working on the program looking at the idea, and uh, today or just the other day we just got to know that some students in Aarhus where where they are very uh, into constructive journalism are starting to make their own agree. So uh, I think that maybe this is sort of going on somewhere around the world. And I also hope that we will continue our program. You mentioned agro constructive journalism, maybe just for our audience, if you can give one sentence definition, because it's a concept which did come from Scandinavia. So you are obviously practicing in your show. You mean what is what constructive journalism is about? Journalism. I, th I think that the very term says, but just in case, you know, is it's basically that 
uh, we journalists are supposed to 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 get uh, the people we interview, people who talk in our shows, or uh, you know, we interview yeah. for our papers, that they come with constructive approach to any issue being discussed, rather than being negative. What's the, the is that the definition? Shall we say that? Yeah, I think it sums it up quite good. It's uh, in, a, in the INI way, it's more like not being, it's trying to show the world like it really is. It's not that polarized. It's not that totally black and white. And it's also the thing with the uh, way of discussing is like comparing it with how you do in your everyday life. And constructive journalism, of course, is also trying to show the world how it really is. It's like putting killing on the front page every day when when the killing rate is going down it's not very constructive and it doesn't tell people how the really how the world really is either so so i think yeah that's very much so just what you said well you know probably some of us when listening to you uh, grow thinking oh my god where where does she live in some arcadia where constructive journalism can work and people can talk without ra raising voices but here is another question from uh, Olena uh, Malrenko. How much time do you spend to prepare program participants for in-frame communication? Sorry? What, for... How much time do you spend to prepare program participants for in-frame communication? For in-frame communication? In well, you know, you already prepared something, so you have a, your, your ideas, you have your objectives and goals of your show. So how much time you, you, you spend preparing your guests um, to participate in this program? To participate in the program. Okay. Um, I think that differed a bit. Uh, like you saw the teacher, we spent quite a lot of time on him. You, do, you need more time with people that are not very used to being in a debate the politicians are doing it sort of every week so i think uh, in general we spent probably a couple of weeks uh, on each program with uh, with preparation with the uh, participants and most on the ones that are not that used to being on television and being in a debate and actually what made because it's interesting with the teacher because he i think he performed very well and by that i mean saying that he ended up uh, saying and being the person that he really was and he was a bit afraid to say what he meant uh, and the reason for that was that he was afraid that he would sort of be bended into the racist side for saying that he really tried but he didn't make it work anyway and I asked him when we had recorded the episode about how he felt so comfortable, even though to say this in, in the meeting with the people being dis disagreeing. And he said that you made me feel safe because you spent a lot of time doing the research and saying that we should, uh, we should feel safe that our opinion is worthy. Thanks, Gro. Um, we have two more minutes. Um, um, I think you've answered most of the questions. Um, just one quick question and please a quick answer. Is it easier to work with people who don't have experience in, the, in appearing on TV or is it harder? Oh, good question. Well, in this, in this situation, I think it was easier because uh, if you aren't too trained in going to the traditional debate, you tend more to act like yourself, but it, but it differs. So be yourself is the best advice we could do. Let your shoulders down and just listen to what you are being asked. That was the best advice we could give in this program. Well, thank you, Gro. I think I've made you feel yourself and being yourself. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. I'll You've been very constructive. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Good luck with the continuation of the show. And I'm sure that very soon we'll hear about your show in Britain. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having me.